You know, I, whenever I come to a place of learning, I am always reminded of the, of the words of a great man who said that the battles of Trafalgar, the future battles of Trafalgar are not going to be won in the waters of the Atlantic, but in the dormitories and fields of Eton. I mean, see, that is the importance of education. I think this Lord Nelson said, it remains a fact that Churchill was a student of Eton. I think Eton or Harrow, whatever. And he is the man who really led England to the war, to the victory in the Second World War. And he said that Hitler would have won, but for the fact that he never studied geography. And he never knew that Russia had a winter. <laughs> <laughs> he actually said it. You know, the importance of education cannot be overemphasized. <coughs> now, you know, my pro life, my profession, my passion are equity markets. Right? And to be very frank, I have two interests in life. And not in the wrong sense, markets and women. And both are considered four letter words markets with risk and women with love. <laughs> and both are interconnected because markets are very much like women. <laughs> Sir John Templeton said markets are like women always commanding, always mistress, always uncertain. Always volatile, always excited. <laughs> Some are very contemptuous, but nobody really wants to understand what is the purpose of these markets. Why are the stock markets existing? Are they needed? Can a country do without them? So, why did the markets exist at all? Why did they start? <coughs> See, just prior to the Industrial Revolution, when there was no large international trade, you know, we were basically an agrarian agrarian society. There was no need for large capital. But when the need just before the industrial revolution, during and after the industrial revolution, there arose the need for large capital, which cannot be provided by single people, single families. Thus was born the idea of the joint stock family, or the joint stock company. Now the people, you all, all know what are the companies, there are limited liability, right? But the people who were owning the shares of the joint stock companies were diverse. They wanted to have a constant ability to sell these shares and have a valuation for these shares. Therefore arose the idea of stock markets and liquidity. So why are stock markets there? They provide capital from, they transfer capital from owners of capital to people who can use capital, right? In order to provide liquidity and a mechanism by which this can be valued and it can be exited and entered, we had the stock markets. So the stock markets have not come because somebody wanted to create a gambling, gambling done as many people think, right? They have a very big purpose because they, have, they transfer capital from users of capital, from owners of capital to users of capital, right? What are these capitals? Capital market, they are the temples of capital allocation, right? And do you understand the importance of capital allocation? Do you know why communism failed? I personally think that as a form of government, communism is a very, very good form. So why did it fail? Because the state allocated capital. And the allocation of capital by the state led to its inefficient use. While in capitalism, it is the markets which allocate capital. Why did Russia fail? Russia was apparently 
So see, Russia, why did communism fail? Because the state allocated capital. And that cap you, allocation of capital led to inefficient use. Look at the steel industry in Russia, it all closed down. The moment capitalism, the moment that uh, communism was out. So, but in, it, it is the stock markets and the markets which allocate capital in capitalist societies. Although there might be some aberration, it's not the end of capitalism, right? Why do you think of Mr. Narottam Sekseria? In 1987, he had half a million tons of cement. ACC may be 15, 20 million tons. But by 2002, 3, Gujarat Ambuja became one of the top two producers of cement in this country. Why? Because he could use capital efficiently. And because he could use capital efficiently, the market gave him far more capital than other companies could raise. So they are the temples of capital allocation. They channelize capital into most productive assets. Right? How do you get risk capital? Where are you going to get risk capital? You may be able to get debt. Where are you going to get equity for any project? Right? Whether you do it in an unlisted company, listed company. Most unlisted companies are also funded with the idea that exit will be through listed companies. So for the growth of risk capital, which is the key for the growth of any society, the, the channels are the equity markets. Could have Mr. Mani been what he is without the equity markets? Sir, Sir Jamshedji Tata would not have put Tata Steel, the one million plant in, 19, in 1900, without the use of public money. So it's very vital. You know, the, most of the industry in India has been given work through the use of public capital. And the, it has, that capital has been accessed through the stock markets. Right? Then, of course, it's a parameter of economic environment. The finance minister is always discussing that is the sensex more greater than his opinion. But the fact remains that for a lot of people, the stock market movements is a barometer of, of, of the economic performance of a country, although it may not necessarily be so. Right? And finally, it is a way where you know, savings can be transferred from owners of capital to users of capital. So therefore, don't think that it's a gambling den or something needed, not needed. Mommy will say, daddy will say, it's not a good place. Whether good or not good, it is needed. One of the reasons why America had, they had this kind of growth was the, its cutting edge capital markets. Right? Although there have been some problems after that, but it's not the end of the story. So I hope I've been able to explain the purpose of markets. Now, you know, people say I mean, I'm called a bull everywhere, although I'm not necessarily a bull, sometimes I'm also a bear. Only by size people call me bull. <laughs> right? So, but what I feel is, I first, when I want to talk about Indian equity markets, I want to first th talk about Indian economic growth. So a lot of people tell me, why are you talking about economic growth? We're interested in the equity markets. But I want to explain that all valuations are a slave of earnings. What I want to say is that the valuation of any stock ultimately depends on the earnings of the company, right? After that, and earnings are a function of economic growth. It is a recorded fact of economic history that the profit growth of the corporate sector in a country is between 1 to 1.5 times nominal GDP growth. Nominal GDP growth is the GDP growth plus the rate of inflation. Right? So if I say that India is going to have 9% GDP growth and 6% inflation, so you have 15% nominal GDP growth. Now, the corporate sector's profit growth is going to be 1% to 1.5 times. Generally, it's 1.2, maybe 1.1, 1.3. So that means what? That if India is going to have 15% nominal GDP growth for the next 5 to 10 years, profit growth in India for the corporate sector will be between 17 to 18% on an average. Some years it could be 12, some years it could be 25. So therefore, a longer term bull market in India is dependent on the growth in corporate earnings. The growth in corporate earnings is dependent on nominal GDP growth. So therefore, before I talk of the long bull market in India, I want to talk about India's economic growth. Because I went to a lot of places and students tell me, sir, why are you giving us a lecture on India's economic growth? We are concerned with the equity markets. <coughs> so I think it's my duty to explain first the relevance of India's economic growth to India's uh, equity markets. Just as I said, the bull market in equity is present in future is a direct derivative of India's economic growth. Right? Now, I use the word inevitability of India's economic growth. I am an opinionated character. 
I had an opinion in 1985 that come what may be, I'm a qualified chartered accountant. I go and invest money in the stock market. Or so my father said, where is the money that you will invest, right? But I was an opinionated character. I thought stock market will do well. I went there. I'm an opinionated character. I think India's growth is inevitable. <coughs> you have just seen the trailer. The picture is actually going to start. And why do I feel it is inevitable? I know some of you all must have been students of chemistry. At least you have done. I've been a very bad chemistry student, right? But the fact is that there is a chemistry which leads to an outcome, a combination of factors, right? Now there is a combination of factors in India. I think some are products of history, some are cultural. Most are irreversible, which gives me the feeling that India's economic growth is inevitable. Right? And I mean much higher growth than what we have. Not the 5%, 6%, 7%, 7%, but 10%. 11%. Why do I feel so? I feel why? Well, India is basically a society of tolerance. See, it was this tolerance which brought the Mughal emperors into India. But what is the modern world about? The modern world is about the ability to anticipate change, accept it, prepare for it, and benefit from it. And rigid minds cannot accept change. If I am to taught at home that this is the only truth, don't believe anything else, right? Or you are brought up in a very, you know, confined cultural fact. You know, you will, your mind will never accept change. But because we and basically Hindu Tava and Hindu religion is the most tolerant and open, we accept change. That's why we're very good at mathematics and science. In the modern world, societies which are not if Saudi Arabia cannot accept change, Saudi Arabia cannot grow. It's a fact. If, you know, Burma can't accept change, Burma can't grow. So I think it is the culture of tolerance which is, which is very, very important for India's place in the modern world. Right? Then we have skill sets. I don't know how to say how, if, how skillful Indians are. And surely it does not only belong to the Indians, to the Mithals, and the yogis, it belongs to every Indian. And I can give you an anecdote that, you know, diabetes is the most researched disease. Why? Because the rich get it, they can afford the drugs. The medicines have to be taken every day. And India is the diabetes center of the world. And it's a lifestyle disease everywhere, right? What they have found is that Indians are most diabetic prone. So they did research. They said, is it got to do with diet? Is it got to do with location? But you know, a company did research where any place where the Indian population was more than half percent, worldwide they did research, they found Indians are most prone. So they said Indians are genetically prone to diabetes. So if Indians can be so successful worldwide, the skill sets only cannot be of the non-residents. So Indians are genetically prone to skills. It's a fact. It's an analogy at all. Right? And look at our doctors, look at our lawyers, right? Where is the skill set which is not available? Look at our professors. What is the skill set which is not available in India? You know how the whole API industry, I don't know, I don't understand the API industry, the raw material for manufacturing tablets. You know how it started in India? Because 1967 or 66, government of India passed an order that Glaxo or any other multinational company has to manufacture the API in India. So they made a plant in India. That was the end of it. Now India is the leading manufacturer of APIs in the world. The Indians saw the plant, they transplanted it. They now make it cheaper than the foreigners. Why? We have made the atomic bomb. We have not chosen the technology from anybody. We have not sold it to anybody. It's all indigenous Indian technology. We are now launching space satellites for Israel. Because we do it at 5% of the cost that NASA wants. So there are so many demonstrations of Indian skill sets, right? I mean, I can go on and on and on. So we are a tolerant, skilled society. Then we are an entrepreneurial society. Only an Indian entrepreneur can put up something like flame, come to a place of, from no, nowhere, right? in the middle of nowhere, and then not dream of creating an educational institution. And Indian entrepreneurial skills, I mean, are, we are among the best entrepreneurs in the world. Millionaires row in London billionaires row in London contains only Indians. And we have proved ourselves not only and see we have a history and culture of entrepreneurship. Right? Then democracy. This is something people don't like. 
but I like very much. Because I, you know, it, it, is, it is what slows us down, but it is what keeps us together. Right? And if you see the list of the 15 richest countries in the world, excluding Singapore and Hong Kong, they're all city states. They don't matter according to me. Right? They are all democratic. They don't matter for a they are like Pune, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in that importance, finally, if in relevance of India, what is the relevance? Right? We have to take everything in its own, uh, you know, in its own perspective. So, therefore, if you see the top 15 nations, those who have had prosperity for the last 50 years, 100 years, they have one quality, they are all democratic. And I think why democracy is See, we don't like democracy, it's like not li 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 liking the husband you have. What about the alternative? <laughs> so dictatorship, anything can happen. You'll have chronic capitalism, the state would be sold. The politicians man managed to sell it in democracy. Suppose you have 100% power, I don't know what they'll do. And I think Indian democracy is now maturing. There is big concern, Mrs. Gandhi wants national rural employment guarantee scheme. Help the rural poor. Why? Because they want the votes. So you want to help the poor because you want their vote. See the power of democracy. And India has got deeply ingrained democracy. For the last 21 years, we have no single party in power in parliament. But all the institutions of democracy, whether it is capital, whether it is the army, whether it is the whether it is the Reserve Bank, whether it is the Company Auditor General, whether it is the judiciary, everything is working independently, and change of government is is. Absolutely as per law. And see, we must understand one thing, that democracy has also evolved in every nation. If I give you anecdotes of what happened in America, you won't sleep at night. Yeah, because in India also the democracy has to evolve. I think the democracy is extremely important, because we don't know if there was no democracy. I don't know if, if Sanjay Gandhi had become the absolute dictator of this nation, what would have done? Nobody knows. Right? Then we have demographics. See, I think this is extremely important. Every society goes through a demographic evolution. Right? And you heard of the baby boomers in America? Now, America went through its most prosperous phase because it was in the most, pro it was in the most favorable demographic phase during those 25 years. Right? And every society goes through this evolution. And for the next 40 years, India is going to have the most favorable demographic profile of any substantial nation in the world. And this cannot be reversed. And China is going to lose it fast because China enforced one children. We tried two, I don't know if we succeeded or not. <laughs> right? But the fact remains that this demographics is extremely, extremely favorable. And all societies have had the greatest prosperity when they have gone through this phase. And this can't be reversed. Even if people have started having more children or less children now, the effect is going to come 40 years later, not uh, next year. So the next two, three decades is, is fixed. Right? Then you have a savings rate. You know, it's very peculiar, you must learn. That it, when you are poor, you save more. The poor save more than the rich. And empirical evidence shows that where there is no banking, and no loans are available, and no social security, saving is the highest. And where loans are possible, so social security is there, people, people spend far more. But in initial stages of growth and development, any society needs savings rate. Because what is growth? Growth is a, how much you invest and at what rate of return you get from that investment. And how will you invest if you don't save? And India has huge savings. I think this year should be 350,000 crores. Of course, government needs away some part of that saving by its deficits. Right? So we have a culture of tolerance, skill sets, entrepreneurship, democracy, demographic, savings rate. Right? Without, in the initial stage of, of growth, the savings rate is extremely important. And then I come to orderly evolution. We are all impatient. Most Indians are dissatisfied with India. What is this? The road is not made. Airport is not good. Right? Electricity is going. But sir, look at Singapore, look at America. But sir, America has 250 years of 
right so i think you know this orderly evolution where at every stage of growth we are setting a faster pace and we are doing it in a rate of growth which is not in a manner which is not satisfactory but according to be most sustainable and then of course you'll have the take off only the problem is that the runway is like bombay airport we don't know when the clearance will take <laughs> right so now you know we have a confluence of reforms see they are acting and and reacting on each other if i do reform in telecom it helps all the other areas if i develop other infrastructure it helps all so these reforms act and react on each other at the same time the country is finding size is finding its own feeling of confidence right it is being recognized internationally the urgency is getting reinforced day by day and therefore finally bombay airport will give runway clearance i think we will uh, we will be on the way to sustainable sustained double digit growth and i see no reason why post 2012 13 or post whatever expiry of this international crisis right whatever form it takes india should not grow double digit so i think this is the reason why i feel why i'm talking all this that india economic growth according to me is going to be 8 9 10% until this the end of the economic crisis worldwide and then we are surely going to have double digit growth so if we have 10% or 9% nominal gdp growth 5 to 6% inflation with 15% you know nominal gdp right i don't see any reason why corporate profit should not grow 17 to 18% so i am talking of india's inevitability because i want that 9% growth figure. i want to be confident of that figure i don't want that 9 become 3 then 3 become 6 and i see no reason why it should in india and i try to order out the reasons why i feel it is inevitable i can't predict the time nimesh bhai only looking at his watch <laughs> right and why i say one is you have the profit growth then what about the money who will buy you know i was very bullish on public sector stocks So the NDT fellows to ask me, but well, FIs don't buy. Who will buy? I said, don't worry. If the girl is pretty, the suitor will come. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so, <laughs> if India is going to have 15% growth, normal GDP growth, right? You have a modernized trading system with demutualization, and we have done demutualization the fastest in the world. And I think today we settle our trades faster than the New York Stock Exchange. and we have done in the last 5 6 years right we have corporate governance through market sort of course in bull market there is no corporate governance <laughs> because corporate misgovernance is the product of bull markets because it's in bull markets when you lose all your senses and greed overwhelms you right we have effective regulatory environment just read the sebi law once you read it you won't you will stop trading all your life we have insurance now which is blossoming and we have inevitability of fi investments where will they invest where growth is 2% right and the rate of interest is 1% or they will invest where growth is 12% or 9% return on equity is 17% 16% right so i the question is not whether they will invest the question is only how much right and i think it's inevitable it's a course they have to invest and they have become emerging markets we have become developed markets because they have current account deficits yeah it's a fact they are now having socialist societies 
because the state is controlling everything right so if you are going to have 15 to 20 percent corporate profit growth you have effective regulatory environment modernized trading system huge savings as far up till now we are a tax paradise we don't know after the tax code no capital gains short term 15 percent dividend tax free i have a friend in dubai i asked him you pay any tax he asked me what is that i don't know so until now in the stock market we can say that but i don't know whether we will do it in the future or not then the question is why will money not flow into equity markets see this is the distribution of savings coming into, in, into equity market this is rbi data right and post 2011 is my prediction now about 17 percent of indian savings in 1991 came to equity markets and it became 1.1 percent in fy05 it's rbi data it's not my data only FY11 is my prediction. And if it goes back to 15% by FY11, what kind of money can you see in equity markets? See this, I made a chart, fund flow for equity markets. It's a complicated chart, but you're all MBA students. So better learn, in life also lead life, better learn to handle complications. So you know how it is explained that you have a gross GDP. You have a saving which goes up every year. Say nominal GDP goes up 13, 14%. Then savings rate. That saving rates is going up every year because of demographic reasons. Because of that, the quantum of savings is going up. Then the quantum of savings coming to financial sector is going up because of education, because of availability, because of communication, right? Then the percentage of financial sector savings coming into the stock market is going up. So here also the flow of money to equity markets is inevitable. Nimit Bhai was telling me in the way that Indian, mutual fund, Indian insurance companies are going to invest $20 billion in an equity this year. And that is one side Ganga. It only comes, it doesn't go back. So, if equity, if India is going to grow at 14, 15%, Nimit Bhai, therefore it's my prediction that by, you know, sorry, by 2011, 45 billion dollars of local money should come into the market. And 2009-10, my prediction is 34 billion. It's, it's, uh, 34 billion, right? It could be 4 billion, 5 billion, less or more, if you have going to have nominal GDP growth, right? Which is for 15 percent, 13%, 14%. You have good trading systems. You have a blossoming financial services industry. You have inability of FI investment. You have huge money waiting to come in then why will the market not go up? This, in the short and long of it, is my bull case. A lot of people ask me, you are bullish. I don't know much. I'm not a professor of economics. I'm Rakesh Janwala, Sher Bazaar, Road Shop. Leo Phatapad, Deo Phatapad. <laughs> right? Because I do trade also. Because no father gives, no father-in-law gives. How do I get the money to invest? So you have to trade, earn it, then invest it. No? Right? So this is in the crux, my bull case for India. And I have put my money where my mouth is. 100% of my assets, I would say 99.9%, 100% of my savings in life are in Indian equity. Right? That's my belief. I don't buy any land, right? And I don't have any investment in any jewelry. So that's my bull case. Okay. Now I want to go about personal investing. You know, a lot of people are interested about investing. But what is this act of investing? How, how does it start? Why do you link investing only to the stock market? Investing can have various asset classes, no? So the first task of an investor is asset allocation. Should I put the money in debt? Should I put the money in equity? Should I put the money in gold? Should I put the money in land? Right? Should I put the money in art? So how do I allocate my assets? Right? I think I'll have to go to the huh? Right? Now, how important is this asset allocation? See, I had to do nothing in life. In, 1980, in 1971, if I had bought gold. In 1980, if I had sold that gold and bought the Nikkei. And 1989, I had sold the Nikkei and bought the Nasdaq. My return would have been 26% compounded. 
You know, 26 percent compounded means your money doubles in some 33 months. So over a period of uh, 30 years, your money will be some 40, 50, 60 times, right? So th this is how important the task of asset allocation is. So the starting point of investing is where, just because Rakesh Janwala says, don't put all your money in equity, right? For any investor, okay? So you, your first task is allocation. And there can be courses and courses and courses on allocation. And it is the 60% result is your allocation of asset and 40% is specific asset in general. Am I right, Dogeesh? Right? So first act is asset allocation. Second is the importance of consistency. Because you're having a lot of students from business families. You know, I come from Agarwal, Marwadi family, so you always say, Vyaj, Vyaj. Satra taka, Sola taka. Right? And I'm proud to admit it here. I am trading roots. Right? And why not be proud of your heritage? You can't change it. Here. Right? So, see the difference between a 10% return and a 15% return over, over 20 years. So, what's when you, when you, I look at, you have that Warren Buffett's compounding, compounding, no. Marwadi ka compounding, or Warren Buffett's compounding, same way. Ki principal badao, aur har saal principal khone ka nahi, aur bhale kam mile, lekin shodli mile ka. But missing one year also breaks you down so badly. So I wanted to point out the importance of asset allocation and of consistency. So don't go for too many risky, too risky assets easily, right? Then second is choosing an investment. This is another boring long one. <laughs> A lot of people ask me, how do you choose an investment? You know, the most difficult adjective in the English language are beauty in a girl and value in a stock. It differs so much from the beholder, right? So how do you find value in a stock? Because for every buyer, there is a seller. Some like Nandita Sen, some like Sushmita Sen, some like Ashwara Rai. So, you know, beauty has its own concept here. Yeah. So, it's so difficult. So, in, in, you know, when I go to buy a stock, someone is selling it. So, therefore, that person feels there's no value in that stock. He's, so, how do you choose a stock? So, see, the basic thing I will tell you is when you invest in a stock, think of the business model of that company. I'm talking of invest, I'm not talking of trading. Huh? Trading may think momentum. Here you think, when you invest, think of business model. Right? And I think the first thing I look at when I invest in a company is the opportunity. Would I have invested in Titan if I didn't feel that the jewelry market in India will go, you know, from 5% branded to say 20% branded? And in five years, if 1 lakh crore is going to be the branded market, is the jewelry market in India, the branded market will go from 5,000 crores to 20,000 crores. So it's a 15,000 crore opportunity. So, you know, nobody can grow bigger than the opportunity. Think of Infosys. What would have Infosys been without the internet? Did Infosys in 93 know that the application of information technology will expand the way it did? But it happened and it expanded Infosys tech opportunity. So the first thing we should look at is opportunity. Look at infrastructure. What opportunity is in India? Right? And of course, when you look at the opportunity, also look at the addressable opportunity. Opportunity infrastructure in India will be 25 lakh crores, but my company can only make water pumps. Only the knowns, the unknowns, to make them knowns is difficult. Right? EPS is predicted to some extent. P is very difficult to predict. But as long as your companies are gathering earnings, P will, can come in three months. Earnings can't come in three months. Say there was no growth, in the corporate sector, in, in the stock market, between, say, 1999 and 2003. Very bad years. But once the market started moving up, the P's, the earnings were accumulating. The, you got the P's just in six months. So as long as the company's earnings are expanding, don't worry. Right? Be patient. If you take it, you have to take it, you have to take it, you Right? And make exit an important decision not driven by profit or loss. I think it's very important. People want to bloody 
sell the flowers and water the weeds. So people want to sell the profitable investments and keep the loss making ones. So I think every exit should be, and I have a slide on exit, is should be an independent decision. Right? Exiting an investment. When would I exit an investment? First thing is I have limited capital and everybody in the world, whether it is Tata, whether it is Birla, whether it is G Capital, everybody has limited capital. So when I find that my asset, any other asset gives me rate of return which is better than what I anticipate on this one, I will exit an asset. I will exit some investment, right? Then review of critical factors. Suppose I feel that Titan's business model is affected, the growth will not come, or, or, or some other company is able to dominate or the margins are permanently impaired, I may say, right? Relative opportunity, as I explained the first one. EPS or EPS expectation peaks, this is very important. You know, in Infosys, in 19,000, McKinsey and Nascom did a study that software industry in India is going to grow 100% every two years. So for two years, three years, Infosys profits grew 100%. Everybody assume for next 10 years, it will grow 100%. So EPS should not peak. May not peak, but if expectation of EPS peaks, that could be a exit point, right? And absurd P, because expectation of P is of a, of e, absurd expectation, right? I think that's the time to sell. And remember one thing: it's not driven by profit and loss. It has to be an independent decision. Okay, sir. I think I'll pass this. You can read this on your own. This is what my partner has written for me. See, these are ethos. This I like to explain. Red enterprises. Our first ethos is God's grace and, and elders' blessings. Because I believe that what we are in the world is not because what we are. We are what we are in the world because of the grace of God and the blessing of elders. There is something, there is a set of circumstances which have come together and brought us where we are. But those circumstances have not been necessarily created by us all. Right? And they have been created by, by God, by elders, right? And therefore never get the belief that I am what I am because I am, because I am smart, I am successful. Never forget there is an upper hand and that hand can go anytime. So I would say my biggest prayer is God's grace and elders' blessings. Right? Then I have an aim to win all wars despite losing many a battle. Churchill has said, you know, that you have to lose many a battle to win a war. I think you all must lead his life. Right? And I think in life, I, I married for 22 years. I must have shouted at my wife at least 220 times, or maybe 2,200 times. My wife would have shouted at me two times. But because she doesn't shout, she wins the, I, she wins the war, right? She loses the battle of shouting, but she wins the war of my love and regard for her, right? I mean, I give you so many examples for trading. You made a mistake. Lose the battle, move on. And of course, I have a motto, where the health is high and the mind is without. I don't want to do anything in life where my head cannot be held high. I have far lesser will than people think, but far more than I need. Wealth also has a purpose in life. Right? So why should I do anything where I can't hold my head high? And that's why I don't manage anybody's money. Except my wife, so I have no choice. <laughs> because I don't want to be answerable to anybody. Right? And I must tell the ladies, I had a professor in law college in Sydney used to say, as long as you are married to your wife under the provisions of the Indian Penal Code, you cannot be charged with raping her, but you can be charged with stealing her money. <laughs> right? So her money, his money is his money and her money is her money. Yeah. Don't forget legally also. And then we have a logo, Rare Enterprises, Green, Compounding. Rare because Rekha is my only wife. And I am R.A. Rakesh, she's R.E. Rekha, okay. right? And we are baseline, this my partner has made, 
inside intellect integrity. I don't know, I, I will tell you all things of my life if you are interested, I don't know. Yes. See, my father was in the, was a commissioner of income tax. I suffered a childhood sickness. I had paralysis of the leg and hand and I had, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, meningitis. And I lost my sight, I lost all my functions. And mysteriously, I don't know, they gave up, then I'll, I'll knock off at two and a half. Then when doctor was there, did an operation, to found a tumor in my spinal cord, and everything came back. And I was always a very curious and assertive child. And I was the youngest in the family, or chote hote hai khote. Right, so, and because of my sickness, my parents were taking special care for me. I went to school first in second standard, right? And my father always used to say, mera to koi business hai nahi. Padoge, likhoge, to kuch kamaoge. So I was a reasonably good student. I completed my chart. You know, my father was interested in the stock market. So he would discuss with his friends in the evening the stock market. So I tell my daddy, yeah, sab Gwaliar ka bhao, what are you all talking? Well, like, you see some news comes on Gwaliar, you know, the stock goes up, up and down. So you see, that's where the stock market moves. So you know, at the age of 14, 15, some are interested in uh, airplanes, some are interested in cricket, some are interested in girls. I got interested in the stock market. So I would read avidly about it. First I would read balance sheet. I'll say share capital, reserve and surplus. Oh, this is a good company. Right, I used to feel those companies were good, uh, high share capital. And I used to wonder, it's all like multinational companies, they don't have high reserve and high share capital. Why the price is so high? And all these Indian companies, they have such high book values. Right, then I learned to read a balance sheet. I did my BCom. In my charter accountancy, so I, 1985, my father said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go to the stock market. So my father said, never do this. I'll never give you any money. Don't go to any of my friends, right? You have a house here, you can live here. You are a charter accountant. If you don't succeed in the market, you can always earn 15, 20,000 a month. He gave me that sense of security. He said, never forget, your word is your bond. Be fearless, may God bless you. For he's the only blesser. No money, my mommy is saying, who will marry you? <laughs> Going to the stock market, doing satta. <laughs> Nobody will give you a girl also. I said, Mommy, don't worry, you'll have one less daughter in law to trouble you. <laughs> right? I went to the stock market, started. I used to carry a bag, go to the street. Anybody who always, father has taught one ear, two ears, and one mouth, but never learned. So, if you customer, you to blah, blah, blah. Tata power is good, this, that. So, I had humble beginnings, initial hurdles. Like my mom, no capital. Then I have a brother, he's a practicing chart accountant. He gave, he gave me, he got me loans of 20 lakhs. One Goan person, his client used to work in Dubai, he gave me 10 lakhs and he won't take security. I went to his house, I said, Mr. Mendoza, so I'm in the stock market, you can me 10 lakhs, I don't want to give you money without security. Boss, I don't want, I want to have security. Actually, he won't keep it, Raki, he said, I have faith in you. I said, no, Mr. Mendoza, you keep your security. That's how I started. 1985, boom. I had nothing when I started 5,000. In one year, I earned 25 lakhs. Paid 3, 4 lakhs tax. I was the king of the world, right? Graduated from smoking 4 square to 5 by 5. Right? Fortunately, found some girl, married her. So my parents found her, I won't lie. Married her. Then 2, 3 years, nothing what to do. My father said, put a factory. So I went to Hyderabad. I had 20, 25 lakhs I had earned. That I kept 20 lakhs, but Tata Power shares and kept them. Right? Then my father said, I will come in the factory also. I said, Daddy, you are from the government service. You can come here once in three months, review everything, and you please stay in Bombay. He said, no, no. I said, I am going to Bombay. Right? So then I came back. You know, these were initial hurdles, but I had belief that, no, I'll do well. And my father told me, if you don't do, I don't, bola, kiska karna nahi. Bola, don't take anybody's money, don't take any, and I'm, by nature I'm very careful in money matters, right from childhood, right? So, I mean, I had 15, 20 lakhs saving, I said, market will, you know, give opportunity. Then I find, I met some friends, right? I met Radha Kishanji Dhawani, he took me to Nimesh Bhai, Ramesh Dhawani, Kamal Kapra, very good people, and all well-intentioned people. So, you know, Interacting, especially with Radha Kishanji, I learned a lot of good things in life. My approach to market change. I also learned on the job. 
maturity. I got maturity about markets. Then came Madhu Dhanwad. Then came this, you know. Uh, again, I went to my dad in '89. Daddy, I said, I have 15 lakhs. You give me 15 lakhs loan. I said, you give me one year grace period. After that, I'll pay you money like a truck driver pays a monthly installment. My father said, no, I'll not do it. Then I said, how to get the money? So I said, I'll trade. There's no other way. I had not, never done any speculation until 89. Right? But I knew it's the stock market is fire. Upon Mr. Mendoza ka shell le lewe. Kabhi satta kar de, boss, I'll go and commit suicide if I can't give anybody's money. Right? And then, you know, I did the initial trades. I learned the importance of capital protection. I paid two, two and a half lakhs tax in 1985. I used to feel like a king. First, we never have money to go and have a drink here. Two lakh ka tax a check sign you feel like a king. Right? This was the initial phase. Then came the budget. Then I remember I made money in Sisa Gwadi. I used to Mr. Bajaj. He used to explain to everybody, just like I used to explain Tata Baba to everybody. Nobody would listen to him. And then when he explained the facts to me, I couldn't believe it. That you know, in IN over, the prices are fixed one year in advance, six months in advance. For the next year, already, you know, the, they had got a price rise over 26% in IN over, right? And there was considerable difference in foreign exchange rates between the pr last year and the current year. So next year was going to be a bumper year. And Sisaka was 26 rupees, nobody would listen to me. And Radha Vishen Damani and Kamal Kapoor. So I used to explain to them, I was the guy who was convinced. I bought 3 lakh shares. I had 50 lakhs worth of Tata Power. I bought 3 lakh shares. Well, leverage, what is there? I said, go to 15 rupees, I'll sell Tata Power and pay it. And I'll tell Radha Vishen and Kamal and they laugh at me. And the price went from 26 to 65 in 3 months. And from 65 to, I think, 20 to 100 in three years. That's how I made the real initial money. And then came Madhu Dhanwadi's budget. I remember Navigation had taken me to meet Nimesh Bhai. People were so bearish, so bearish. And I was sure that, you know, miss and one thing that VP Singh will not give a budget will hurt the business community. See, he was the man who first reduced rates of tax, who abolished estate duty. And he was a, although he was a, he was a thakur, he was a businessman. So I stake my life in that budget. Right? And I must have been worth one, one and a half crores when the day of the budget. And I was worth 20 crores the next day. I stake my life. Right? And that's how I made the real initial money. Okay? Then, when we experienced the great, my, you know, I remember the index, Teji started at 600. Then I think it went to 1800. Then came the Gulf War. Right? The index came back to 1100, 1200, and then came Mr. Mehta, the great Mr. Arshad Mehta. <laughs> right? So initially when the stock, you know, we bought ACC. I had taken delivery, I remember, of some 15,000 shares of ACC at 300. We sold at 2800, 2900, 3200, 3300. Price came back to 2300, 2400. Then it came back 3500, we all shorted. Then one cold afternoon, I all shot and price, I went and cut all my shots. Then we made money in the rise. And then we knew all this thievery money. When the market came down, we made the money of our life. You know. And then, you know, trading, investing, cooking, it can't be taught. It has to be learned. And it has to be learned on the field. I mean, Mary Mummy, jo dal banati hai, my wife can't make. You know, she has seen my mother make it 100 times. Right? So it is something it is, you have to learn. Shorting and pyramiding we learned. I trade actively, boss. I'm not only an investor and all. My father has not left me any inheritance, so I have to earn and invest. Right? We learned shorting and pyramiding. We learned prudent betting that how in you know markets you have to be very prudent. You learn to take a loss. Then you know I realized one thing in life which is very important. I think ambitions cannot overshoot market opportunity. I think what happens, look at Rakesh and why enough money. Right? Let's go into let's put some industry. My wife will say, What are you doing it all for? Kuch kam Dividend income No trading, investing when there's not much work, work, right? The importance of reading, experiencing, and learning. You know, then when you introspect, you understand what you have learned, what you have gone through, right? Then participation in tech boom. You know, when I set up the software, I am illiterate as far well as software is concerned. And all this young generation people understood up to about 97 What is this software software here? Yeah? Never used a computer. I used to think it's garbage in, garbage out. In my CA final, I did not take computers. I never understood very weak technically. Then 97, 98, I understood. 
तो हमने भी थोड़ा बहुत हाथ मार लिया वट सम टेक्स स्टॉक्स देन यू नो प्राइवेट इक्विटी एवरीबडी इन्वेस्टिंग प्राइवेट इक्विटी आई ऑल्सो सेट आई इन्वेस्ट ट्वेंटी क्रोज तो बीस करोड़ का कुछ मिला वापिस तीन चार करोड़ पूरा तो नहीं डूबा वी नेवर अर्न बट वी लर्न एंड एट लूट दैट वॉज वन ऑफ माई मोस्ट फोर्सफुल पीरियड्स ऑफ लर्निंग एज एन इन्वेस्टर because i saw how actually companies what are the problems what are the unrealistic expectations right how entrepreneurs lose their minds how competitive ability is just a myth how there are me to do companies the difference between a real company and a me to company it was a great education i think that money lost was well lost right and then of course i made the biggest money of my life in the psu i was very bullish on the psu and if you very proud i started buying bharat electronics from 18 rupees today also the price is 1600 i have sold out right it's uh, and <coughs> i remember during the tech boom people were buying all penta himachal global i used to buy all this psu stock shipping corporation 20 rupees i bought price is 24 i am very happy so i used to walk in in the street of the stock market so people used to gada aaya bandhu aaya buying psu stocks शेयर बाजार में जो जीता वो सिकंदर आप समझे ना बट दैट प्रूव टू मी द बिगेस्ट जैकपॉट ऑफ माई लाइफ एंड दिस इज अ डिफाइनिंग टाइम आई रियलाइज इन टू थाउजेंड वन टू द इंडिया इज ऑन द थ्रेश होल्ड ऑफ अ सेक्युलर एंड स्ट्रक्चरल बुल मार्केट एंड आई रोड सो इन द इकोनॉमिक टाइम्स राइट आई थॉट आई इन्वेस्ट इन ग्रोथ स्टोरीज कॉन्सेंट्रेटेड पोर्टफोलियो कॉन्सेंट्रेटेड एंड डाइवर्सिफाइड एट द सेम टाइम I thought I had some maturity as an investor. Buy right, hold tight, exit in frenzies, right? Meaningful stakes. I wanted to invest stakes, you know, where I have some at least person, two person, three person in the company. I want to be a value-adding investor. Organization building, right? Until now, I was my company's damaging director, chairman, pion, everything. Then I got some people. Try to make a team, right? I have two partners now. and then resisting temptations resisting temptation very important people will come hamare share ka bhav i'll get a call from my sister in law see this company fellow wants to meet with jija ji is very much interesting abhi kisko bhi na bolenge abhi sali ko kya na bolenge right so we call call them you see our stock our earning is 50 rupees per share but the price is only 120 so i said your duty is to inform and perform perform and inform bola no sir you know we i said how can i help you bola we will do market leak i said what is this so then they will explain you don't understand the price is 120 we will give you 10 lakh shares at 80 rupees then we'll hit the share and make it 160 sometimes you think of the money involved resisting those temptations but i know that anybody who's try to misbehave with a stock market or with a woman the road is hatha nahi See, fire, stock market, and woman. There is no difference. Never misbehave with any three of them. It's a learning of life, right? So I'm resisting. I learned how to resist those temptations, right? And I have a lot of aspirations, and I want to share them with you, right? One aspiration is to be your age again, yeah. so that I could have the free mind, you know, excitement, the world at your feet, dating all the beautiful girls, right? First is institutionalization. I want to, and a perpetual view. See, I want my rare enterprise to live beyond me, right? And I want to institutionalize it so it grows beyond Rakesh Jhumbar, right? And I'm making efforts. Then I want to trade and invest in other asset classes, maybe debt. Of course, I'm doing it in a small way. It has opened up in India now, right? Other geographies. It's a dream. I was telling you, which way on the way. That is the dream of my life. To after India has capital account convertibility. to trade and invest to trade and invest all over the world right of course i have i sab upar wale ke baad hoga nahi ho no then i want to be an investor of choice i want entrepreneurs to feel that he and not by acting but by actually doing things by adding value to my investments by adding value to the companies in which i invest right i want to do philanthropy i believe the giver of this wealth is god and he is cast this social responsibility that it must be used for good social purpose and i don't want to give my children money beyond a point i want to give them freedom and the right of choice i don't know whether the mother will agree or not right i want to be deleverage 
बट होता नहीं है इफ आई है बैंक बैलेंस इन द नाइट आई कान स्लीप इफ आई पे इंटरेस्ट ओनली आई गेट्स गुड स्लीप राइट एंड आई वॉन्ट टू बी अ थिंक So think strategically, think beyond markets, and I want to be people skill focused. And I'm trying to work on all of them. I need your blessings. And I just some student advice I would like to give give students. Right? See, one thing I can tell you: you can never achieve without dreaming. But dream with your feet on the ground, and your head also on the ground. Not with your feet in the air and the, your head held down. So whatever you can do, or dream, you can begin it. Boldness has genius power and magic in it. Whenever you start, it, all don't forget in life, all things big start small. At the same time, be practical. Right? Do something you love. This is very important. Do it with passion. I think I succeeded in markets, whatever level I did, because I love markets. I have a passion for them; they are my life. So do something that you love, right? The means are as important as the end. Never forget that, right? Aspire but never envy. And the means are as important as the end. Remember one thing: don't comment on other people's integrity and means, and expect other people also not to comment. Aspire but don't envy. See, this is a very very important thing. My father taught. See my father. I always had rich friends, right? My father always used to tell me, Rakesh, never ever forget the give up the ambition of being bigger, richer than anybody in the world. But just because they are richer today, don't envy them. There is a difference between envy and aspiration. Envy means it becomes jealous. You know, it becomes sort of jealous. Aspiration is that I want to be so. So I think there's a very big difference between aspire and envy, right? I think also you know Mr. Darwai said taught me learn to learn from success. In India, what people do, they, you know, they, uh, they, 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 they bring down other people's success. They say, oh, successful, oh, chow, oh, usne aisa kiya, usne aisa kiya. Darwai said always you say success doesn't come easily, and and respect other people's success and learn to learn from. Right. Be paranoid of success. Never take it for granted. You know, never forget one thing in life, my friends, that all adjectives in life are transient and temporary. Success, beauty, power, wealth, taste. Right. So never take success for granted. And don't be surprised if it goes away. Be prepared for that day. You'll never be disappointed. Fight to have it, but be prepared. Right. Build a fighting spirit. Take the good with the bad. You know, life is full of surprises. Some are good, some are bad. But resolve not to break down and be overwhelmed. And I will say, as I started life, I looked at the horizon. I used to dream of the day when I could earn fifty thousand rupees a month. I thought, what? I'll be a king here, right? So I looked at the horizon. It seemed so so distant and far. But only when I reached that horizon did I realize how many more there are. So thank you, friends. I can also have been going blah 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 for one hour. More than that, thank you so much for inviting me.